She was a spiritual genius and the mother of the new age. Given her lifelong concern with things mystical, metaphysical, and spiritual, it's perhaps surprising to discover that she had an effect on the world we know in ways we could hardly imagine. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky, HPB, whatever you call her, she was a larger-than-life woman. Blavatsky would make it commonplace to see Eastern religions, Hinduism, and Buddhism as important sacred teachings. It's not just yoga that has become part of Western life. It's everything from crystals to religious icons to books on esoteric secrets of the East and West. This woman who was ahead of her time, who had an impact on our world in far-reaching ways, began life as Helena Petrovna von Hahn. She was born in what is today the Ukraine in 1831. Uh, she showed some tendency towards what we would call psychic phenomena and was a rather impetuous child, very independent minded. Helena was born to a very strong mother. She was a woman who wrote a lot and thought a lot. She's actually considered to be responsible for the women's rights movement in Russia in the 19th century. Uh, and she had uh, been married to a military man who was, uh, who was absent a lot of the time and was not so interested in his children. Now when Helena was born, she was born premature and no one thought she was going to live and so it was arranged to have her baptized within 24 hours of her birth because it was thought that she would die. During the baptism ceremony, uh, the, the young aunt of uh, Helena, who was a young girl, uh, was uh, stumbled with a candle she was holding and it fell on the robes of the priest who was doing the baptismal ceremony and uh, enveloped him in flame. And that, from the very beginning, started rumors about this baby being some kind of a witch or something very strange or having odd powers and so on. Now, she didn't die. Her mother took very good care of her and uh, was very defensive of her and protected her against the prejudices that had developed against her. When she was a young girl, <clears throat> about age three or four, she had a lot of conversation and experience with invisible playmates. And uh, they were very real to her, and no one else could see them, of course. She also... Uh, later on uh, said that, she, that there was a Hindu, a man in a turban, who would visit her and uh, appear to her and that he would save her whenever she was in danger of getting hurt. Uh, later on she would say that that was Master Moria. Um, at the age of around 11 or 12 her mother died and she was taken with her other siblings to another castle to live, again, without very much uh, uh, association with her father. And in this castle, which was uh, a place that contained a huge library of her uh, grandfather, who was a master mason and a very interested in alchemy and all the other things that were related to esoteric topics, she read and she kept herself uh, occupied by reading constantly and she devoured all this information that, that she could find in the uh, in the library and that is where she gained a great deal of knowledge uh, that comes out in some of her earlier writings although uh, much of the knowledge she gained is not cannot be explained by simply that uh, that contact that she had <clears throat> When she was 16, she was forced into a marriage because uh, people thought it would be good for her, or healthy for her to get married. She didn't want to get into marriage, and she it was a disaster, and she very quickly ran away from home and spent the next 10 years on, uh, uh, on an odyssey of travel around the world, everywhere from Asia to Mexico. Uh, she said that she disguised herself as a man and joined the Foreign Legion and fought in the Foreign Legion. We do know that she also at one point was part of Garibaldi's troops 
trying to free Italy and that she was wounded in those battles and that she was also dressed as a man for those things. But after this point she began her travels and those travels uh, became very, very important because on the travels she was able to firsthand experience shamans and witches and uh, people doing uh, uh, things that were supposedly supernatural and she made her first connections with a lot of her original teachers who taught her all kinds of interesting things. She was beginning in childhood but more in adolescence also exposed to Russian occultism in the form of Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism because her great-grandfather had a vast library that in her later recollections she said she had devoured every book in. It could be that this is where she got much of her knowledge that uh, she was famous for in later life. As a child, Helena displayed unusual behavior. Her family was often concerned about her future. Her parents tried to remedy her bizarre behavior and personality by forcing her into an early marriage that was a disaster. She ran away from home and started traveling around the world and began her real spiritual odyssey. Um, beginning 20 years, really, of, of world travel. She would have been one of the very, very few women who traveled uh, alone. Her behavior was totally outside the norm, outside boundaries for a woman in that um, century, unless the person happened to be a queen or someone who was in a, an inherited position of authority. Blavatsky tells us that during this period she disguised herself as a man and joined the French Foreign Legion and served in the French Foreign Legion for some time doing very dangerous duty. There's not much said about what she was doing, except that she apparently went to those locations where the esoteric or occult knowledge was prominent. Uh, she traveled to India, uh, in the Far East. She uh, traveled to America, North and South, investigating mystic traditions the world around. Her next phase was wandering mostly in Eastern Europe in the company of a man named Agardi Mitrovich, who was a Hungarian opera singer and also a political radical who involved her in the struggle against the Catholic domination of Italy. He got a job uh, with a touring company or a job at the, in Cairo, probably with the Cairo Opera House. They got on a ship. There were 400 passengers on it, and it had um, a cargo in part of gunpowder. And uh, the ship blew up off the coast of Greece. Agardi um, went down with the ship. Most of the people went down with the ship. Uh, Volvatsky survived. She went on to Cairo, and she uh, tried to establish a life for herself there. And how she supported herself was giving seances. She connected with the community there uh, that were into paranormal phenomena. Although very interested in spiritualism, HPB's understanding of the phenomena was somewhat different than her fellow mediums. But she did explore this world and produced many manifestations. She could slow time down. Uh, some other examples where she could make things appear or disappear. Uh, yes, so all of these were uh, demonstrated. In 1873, Madame Blavatsky continued her spiritual journey and set sail for the United States. She read in the paper stories written by a man named Henry Olcott. 
Henry Steele Alcott was a respected member of New York society. He had worked for the New York Tribune. With a lingering interest in spiritualism from his youth, Alcott decided to investigate some intriguing spirit manifestations that were occurring at a farmhouse in Vermont. Convinced of the validity of the spirits, he wrote an account of his observations for the New York papers. He then headed back to the farmhouse to investigate the phenomena further. Their home became a gathering place for spiritualists to witness physical phenomena. So entities would appear and walk around the room and be touched by the persons in attendance. The heyday of, of spiritualism involved physical manifestations and the Eddy brothers were famous for providing a plethora of unusual and fascinating appearances. Madame Blavatsky was intrigued both by a desire to continue her investigation into spiritualist phenomena and perhaps to meet the author of these interesting articles. So she was at this Eddie Brothers farm? According to Alcott, HPB certainly stood out in a crowd. My eye was first attracted by a scarlet Garibaldian shirt she wore, as in vivid contrast with the dull colors around. Her hair was a thick blonde mop, worn shorter than the shoulders, and it stood out from her head, silken soft and crinkled to the roots. I whispered to my companion, Good gracious, look at that specimen, will you? Alcott recalled that Madame Blavatsky went outside and rolled herself a cigarette. He walked over to her and said, Permettez-moi, madame, and offered her a light. Later he said that their acquaintance began in smoke, but it stirred up a great and permanent fire. Not only was Alcott's first meeting with Blavatsky memorable, but the manifestations they experienced together at the Eddy farm convinced him of how extraordinary she was. According to HPB, the spirits they encountered during their seances were numerous, and many were familiar to her. Their friendship solidified, and the two returned to New York. Shortly after their arrival, they moved into it, not as a couple, but more as kindred spirits. In fact, they liked each other enormously. They got on, and there was a, a great affection there. She only became a spiritual teacher after she made the crucial connection with Henry Steele Alcott, who at the time was a prominent spiritualist, and who became her entree to the world of New York spiritualism. She begins to write letters to the editor, either defending spiritualists or attacking their critics, making a name for herself in the spiritualist press, where Alcott is already fairly well known. There was a place that they stayed called the Lamasery, in, in which uh, uh, Blavatsky had a department uh, loaded with some of her collections from India and elsewhere. And she would hold soirees and tell stories. And, and she very quickly became very well known amongst the elite and the intellectuals. Blavatsky starts to become a uh, book author in her own right, slowly beginning to work on what became Isis Unveiled. This was HPB's first major work and offers her insights on both Eastern and Western religion and philosophy. Alcott was her collaborator in the writing process, which involved many strange phenomena which convinced him that she was being assisted by invisible helpers, not only in the spirit world, but living men elsewhere who were communicating te telepathically or occupying her body and writing through her. Blavatsky explained that these invisible helpers were adepts or masters who are part of a brotherhood of enlightened spiritual beings. Alcott talks about hands appearing mysteriously and writing. 
during the night while she's asleep, the composition process of Isis Unveiled is only the first instance where the authorship of items that appear under her name is somewhat confused because both she and Alcott say that there were many others helping behind the scenes. She started writing and she said, well, I, I get it from my masters. They're dictating to me or I see it in, in the astral light, the inner worlds. And uh, I remember when I first read that, I said, oh, yeah, right. And I found myself very soon running back for, an, for a glossary because the terminology was, was a huge barrier. I didn't know what all this Eastern philosophical terminology meant. And yet here was a person who was touching every conceivable subject of importance in areas of religion and philosophy and science, uh, written with knowledge. And I said, how can a person know so much about so many things and handle it uh, uh, with skill in this way? I just didn't know. HPB communicated mainly with two masters, Moria and Kuthumi. These people lived in Tibet, but they weren't Tibetans. They were Indians. And the Brotherhood had picked her to disseminate their ideas as much as they want to reveal to the world through the madam. They feel they can do more for the world by not being visible personalities. And there, is, there has been a lot of interesting developments of that idea where one hears about ascended masters and so forth. Um, they themselves say, no, no, we're fully physical. Uh, we are what we are by virtue of our training. Uh, we have spent our lifetime uh, pursuing uh, spiritual and philosophical and, and uh, scientific questions. And we feel that we have some answers that we can provide that help humanity to understand what they are, where they came from. The answers to the questions of ultimate concern. These masters are more spiritually evolved. That means that they can live longer, hundreds of years. Uh, they have much more knowledge. They are almost, um, if you can use an analogy, almost uh, 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 resembling, we might say, the hidden hand theory, which means that behind this world, there is a small cadre of individuals who are controlling things. And so these masters are... Uh, in separate brotherhoods in India, in Egypt, and elsewhere, who are helping to perhaps uh, control the progress of the planet and spreading the wisdom. While living in New York, many guests visited the Lamasery and were entertained and intrigued by HPB's stories. They were also touched by something profoundly important in our words. Uh, the two of them had many discussions and they also had many visitors to their apartment. People who were also interested in the occult. Who found everything that Madam had to say very interesting and at some point uh, Alcott said to this little group, wouldn't it be uh, useful to form a club or a society to study the occult phenomenon further. And uh, Man Vlasti said, yes, that's a very good idea. The Theosophical Society was formed in 1875 and still exists today with branches all over the world. And the, uh, the original objective of the society was very simple, one, one sentence long to collect and diffuse a knowledge of the laws of the universe. Period. Once a student abandons the old trodden highway of routine and enters upon the solitary path of independent thought, Godward, he is a theosophist, an original thinker, a seeker after the eternal truth with an inspiration of his own to solve the universal problems. According to HPB, theosophy, or divine wisdom, refers to the ultimate truth of the supreme, the cosmos, and humanity. 
It is a truth that has existed from the dawn of time. There has been some question about how the masters communicated with HPB from their home in Tibet. Along with Alcott, many of Blavatsky's followers claim to see these masters as well. Some explain this as examples of astral projection. There is quite a bit mentioned about out-of-body experiences or astral projection. So it could very well be that this was the true purpose of the society. How do you, in fact, um, go beyond your, your ordinary imperfect self and become perfected, to become an adept, for instance. And it, it seems to me that if you put this together with the notion of the masters, it could very well be that the masters were perceived to be human beings who projected themselves out of the body. And that was the reason why they can go literally anywhere in the world to communicate with individuals. That is the reason why uh, masters were not looked upon with skepticism, that, that they did have this ability and that they themselves, theosophists, expected to have this same ability. Perhaps this helps to explain some of the unusual phenomena that HPB was said to perform. Her being able to physically transform her appearance into that of a man with black hair and then change back into herself. Alcott describes things like this that are just impossible to interpret but remain fascinating as to what was really going on. Isis Unveiled was published in 1877 and the first edition sold out within 10 days. Not surprisingly, the reviews were mixed. The New York Herald called it one of the most remarkable productions of the century, while The Sun called it discarded rubbish. Reviews aside, HPB was undoubtedly pleased her message was reaching a wider audience. Eventually, the decision was made to spread the message of theosophy further. They remained in New York until 1878, when the decision was made, probably on Alcott's advice, that they, Blavatsky and he, go to India, which he considered to be the land of the sacred wisdom, where more of the sacred wisdom could be found than any other place in the world. And that was the reason why they went. This was the beginning of Olcott's work to try to revive Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia. And for a large degree, Olcott was successful. Blavatsky also supposedly gave Indians a better understanding and more respect for their own culture. They were the first Westerners to become Buddhists in a formal official ceremony. There were certainly Westerners who became admirers of Buddhism before that, but never this kind of formal affiliation. Once they became established, eventually they headed over to Madras and they bought some property called Huddlestone Gardens. And that became the future headquarters of the Theosophical Society. It was around this time that they met A.P. Sinet, who was to become a very important figure later on in the society. Sinet was the editor of the Pioneer, and he publicized the coming of the two Theosophists, and he had after meeting Blavatsky, some questions about theosophy, what the teaching was all about, and apparently was contacted by a master through a letter. And out of this came a correspondence that lasted from about 1880 to 1886. The number of letters it was about 145 that were exchanged. All of these letters were written either by Kutumi or Moria. Sinet was not the only one who received letters from the masters. 
there were those who believed wholeheartedly in their authenticity. Others had their doubts. She did miracles like crazy. The letters from Kuthumi giving instructions to her or just giving information were flying like crazy. They landed on people's heads. They uh, landed um, next to them on a table. Um, the letters sometimes came through the mail. Whoever she wished to influence or wished to convince that she was who she said she was came through these letters, which I referred to uh, not really facetiously, but as the astral post office. Because the idea of the Brotherhood was very in intriguing. And in a way, it still is. I mean, the idea of a, a group that's looking out for the best interests of the world that reincarnate when the world needs them, someone who's keeping track of things. It's not just all chaos. In 1885, with a heavy heart, HPB left India for good. Alcott remained to carry on the work they had started together. With a few stops along the way, she eventually settled down in London. My heart is broken physically and morally. For the first I do not care. Master shall take care it does not burst so long as I am needed. In the second case there is no help. I was ready to shed the last drop of life in me, give up every hope for the last shred of, I shall not say happiness, but rest and comfort in this life of torture for the cause I serve and for every true theosophist. She again presided over a, a lodge in London that was a very hot ticket to be invited to attend. And it was not simply theosophists that came to see her, but anybody who was interested in the subjects that she discussed and in meeting a very controversial and intriguing figure. Then, in the last two years of her life, she, she drew the attention of a well-known British woman named Annie Besant. Annie Besant was a feminist, a union organizer, a a uh, writer, a um, person who uh, was enormously admired in British society. Getting the approval of a woman like Annie Besant brought her enormous number of new converts, uh, much better press than she had ever had before. Uh, Van Blavatsky left the Theosophical Society to Annie Besant. She turned it over to her, and with that, she achieved the ultimate respectability. During this period of her life, she wrote The Secret Doctrine, the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy. This is Blavatsky's masterwork on theosophy, covering cosmic, planetary, and human evolution, as well as science, religion, and mythology. Obviously, that means that she wants to be taken seriously as somebody participating in the intellectual debates of her time. I think if her work had not been completed, she would have continued on for a while longer. Many people who are mediums or psychics or use their energy in ways that involve things like channeling, uh, have health problems. Many of them die young and many of them uh, uh, grow weak and other things occur. Now in the case of Blavatsky and what she was doing, she was actually channeling and she was uh, bringing through information and it was a self-sacrificial thing for her. She knew what she was doing, but it caused her to have uh, extreme health problems, problems and glandular problems such that she grew grossly fat and eventually towards the end of her life had to be literally transported around in a wheelbarrow. It was influenza. And she was sitting in her uh, easy chair with uh, friends around her. They knew she was dying and off she went. And that simple. Age 59. Every big newspaper in the United States had at least one and sometimes two articles about her death and they were always on the front page. 
because she by this time was a world celebrity some people didn't know what she was a celebrity for but they knew she was famous for being famous Helena Petrovna Blavatsky controversial extraordinary larger than life harbinger of the new age a mystic force is rising it is but the first rustling but it is a superhuman rustling it is supernatural only for the superstitious and ignorant the spirit of truth is passing now over the face of dark waters and in parting them is compelling them to reveal their spiritual treasures and this spirit is a force that cannot be hindered and can never never be stopped